I am reading The Gay Revolution, The Story of the Struggle by Lillian Faderman. We are in Part 8, Demanding to Serve. Chapter 25, New Gays and Lesbians versus the Old Military. So, earlier on, where was it? In like... Chapter 3, very early on in the book, they talk about gays in the military, like, pre-1950, and, or up to the 1950s, and how, so just, I'm going to, like, kind of summarize a bit of that before we move into this chapter, because I think maybe that's relevant. Uh, she talks about how lesbians wanted to be in the military back then, because I'm talking about, um, I'm about to start reading chapter 25, New Gays and Lesbians versus the Old Military. And I'm just going to explain that in chapter three, she kind of went, she kind of talked about um, gays in the military up until, um, up until about the 1950s. So in that chapter, she talks about how a lot of lesbians wanted to be in the military because if you were busy serving the military, obviously nobody was expecting you to be married. Also how it was like, you know, not socially acceptable to be like working, especially like in the 30s and 40s, if you were a woman, if you were married. So like, it made sense for lesbians to be in the military. Also, they could like make money and not be financially dependent on a man and like uh, get job skills and recommendations to like join the workforce once they got out of the military. So it's practical for them. Um, and it also talked about how when they really needed people in the military in like during World War One and World War Two, they didn't really enforce the no gays in the military thing because they had like other shit to worry about and they didn't want to like get rid of people serving because they needed them. Um, but then there was like, as soon as World War Two was over or World War One was over, there was like sharp upticks in the amount of like investigation into how many gays were in the military and like um, hunt kicking them out. Um, and in that chapter, it also talks about. Um, um, how even once you were done your military service, the military police, if they like, even if they heard, okay, so there's two things. One thing is that in that chapter, she talks about how they didn't even need any evidence. They just needed one person to say they thought she did something homosexual or that they like for one rumor to be started. And that was enough for them to give you like a dishonorable discharge, which made you like unemployable in any field afterwards um, and made sure that you had no um, military pension or benefits. Um, and um, some lesbians actually took that to court and were like, there's no evidence. Like, you took away our pension and dishonorably discharged us when there's zero evidence. Um, and the judge actually was like, yeah, for them to have done this, which is definitely okay, they would have had to have evidence. Um, and then there's another story where there was, like, this retired whatever, some kind of higher end type officer, military retired, um, like a lieutenant admiral or some shit, I don't know. Uh, retired, the military police spent, like, weeks spying on him, like, a group of four of them, to find out if he's, like, doing the homosexualities, and he was. And they, like, brought him to military court and took away his pension and, like, demoted him. Even though he wasn't, like, actively serving anymore, it was the first time in history that somebody was court-martialed after they had been retired. Um, I think, anyway, at least I'm misremembering something. Uh, so yeah, that's the chapter three talking about, um, the arm, um, the military, the U.S. military and homosexuality. Um, I'm talking to you, one person who is listening to me. Now this, I think this is going to be like, cause this is called new gays. So I think that's like after 1970 gays, um, based on this book. So we are in part eight, Demanding to Serve, um, chapter 25, New Gays and Lesbians versus the Old Military. The Good Soldier. As a boy growing up in the 1950s on Charleston Air Force Base in South Carolina, red-headed and bean-pulled skinny, Leonard Maltovich had a recurring reverie. He was a Civil War soldier in the Battle of Gettysburg on the side of the Confederacy. Maltovich didn't question the racism around him, not even during the years when Blacks began fighting for their civil rights. If Black people showed up in the white housing area where he lived, 
with his sergeant father and the rest of his family, the teenage Maltovich joined the kids who grabbed rocks and the Confederate flags and chased the intruders out. On Saturday nights, he and the other white teens from Charleston Air Force Base would ride a bus through the Negro parts of town, shouting out the windows, 2468, we don't want to integrate. Yeah, Little Rock. Lovely. Oh, hey, Emma. <laughs> yeah. I'm also streaming this on Clubhouse, but there's nobody on there either. It's just like an audio app, so it's just people listening to audio. I think they mentioned this Maltovich guy previously. I'm not sure when. I don't think it was in the chapter three. I think it was more recently. Feel free to comment as much as you would like. like. I'm not gonna keep this stream up, so I'm gonna stop reading and like give li like commentary as I go and even converse with you and the other person who just turned in. At 19, Leonard Maltovich followed his father's footsteps and enlisted in the Air Force. 12 years later in 1975, now a sergeant himself, he appeared on the cover of, oh, that's who he fucking is. Okay, I remember who he is now. Yeah, he was like the first out gay military guy in the 70s. He now appeared on the cover of Time magazine. He is wearing a blue Air Force cap and a crisp white shirt on which were pinned his many military decorations. Superimposed on the picture was the declaration, I am a homosexual. He was the first openly gay person to be on the cover of Time. How he got there and had, had to do, first of all, with his transformation from stone-throwing young bigot to supporter of black civil rights as he came to know black people in the Air Force. After three tours of duty in Vietnam, Maltovich volunteered to teach courses in the Air Force Race Relation Program. It had been created in 1971 after a three-day race riot at Travis Air Force Base, instigated by people who were like he'd once been. For four years, as Maltovich talked in the classroom about inequality and justice, it began to dawn on him that gays needed to fight for their rights, just as other minorities were doing. This is a common theme in this book. It's like white people support the civil rights, like the civil rights movement and then they're like oh shit i'm a gay maybe we need to do the same thing um one day he asked his class which do you think is the most oppressed minority group in america his students guessed blacks hispanics natives americans maltovich wrote on the board homosexuals it had taken leonard maltovich a long time to arrive at that point just a few years earlier he joined the church of the latter-day saints hoping mormonism would somehow help him exercise the homosexual feelings which he had troubled him since he was 12 years old his fears about those feelings had been reinforced by his political sentiments, which had always tilted right. He'd once described his father's politics as being so conservative he makes Genghis Khan look like a Jesse Jackson. The apple didn't far fall far uh, fall far from the tree. Leonard Maltovich had even toyed with joining the far-right John Birch Society, though he settled for registering as a Republican and voting in 1964 for Barry Goldwater, an adamant opponent of the welfare state, the Soviet Union, and labor unions. Maltovich's patriotism assumed a disdain for what he called the loony left and its criticism of the United States. He liked to say of America, we are truly better than the average bear. But because he grew up as a military brat and knew well the military's attitude towards queers, he never even hugged or put his arms around anyone other than family until he was 30. But in 1973, he chanced to hear about Pensacola, Florida, a gay nightclub from one of his students in his race relations class, a straight captain who said he'd wandered in not knowing it was a homosexual hangout. Maltovich, sweating and shaking, dared to go look. Once inside, he acknowledged to himself what he'd long suppressed. A million pounds just left my shoulders, he thought. His first homosexual experience followed. The next year, he read an article in the March 27 issue of the Air Force Times that started, startled and thrilled him. Homosexuals in Uniform, it was called. And it mentioned Dr. Frank Kemeny as the founder, way back in 1961, of an organization that was fighting for gay rights in Washington, D.C. Maltovich had never heard of such an organization. He'd never even heard of the Stonewall Riots. He wanted to talk to Kemeny. He called the long-distance operator, asking for the number of a Frank Kemney in D.C., expecting her to say there was no listing. But there was. Dr. Franklin Kemney. Maltovich wasn't sure what to say. He'd say he was teaching a race relations class. He'd ask Kemney if he knew of materials he might use in his class to show that homosexuals, too, suffered prejudice. It took him almost two weeks to muster the courage to make the call. 
They talked for an hour. Kemeny mentioned that he was working with the UCLA military lawyers. They were helping gay men and lesbians who'd been thrown out of the military get their dishonorable discharges upgraded to honorable. But he and the UCLA would like to do more. They were looking for an ideal case, someone who had a perfect military record, wanted to stay in the service, and was willing to publicly declare, I am a homosexual, and was ready to fight in court when the military discharged him for it. Maltovich didn't exactly tell Kemeny he was gay during the phone conversation, but before they hung up, he did nervously say, well, I think I know an individual who might fit the bill. But he'd been a lifer in the Air Force, and he really believed in service to his country. What would he do with himself if he were kicked out? But he'd been teaching about justice and equality for so long that he believed in that too, and he believed in heroic gestures. It took four months of weighing before Maltovich called Frank Kemney to say, I'm the guy I was talking about, I'm ready. Frank Kemney, by now an old hand at fighting the military on behalf of gays and lesbians, um, I think he started doing it in like the 1950s, <clears throat> poured over Leonard Maltovich's record. When other young men were running off to Canada to avoid getting drafted and sent to Vietnam, Maltovich enlisted, and he asked to be sent there three times, because that's where my nation needed me, he said and he'd hoped to play a modest role in spreading democracy. Maltovich was wounded by a landmine in Da Nang when he was preparing to assemble a frontliner radar system. After he recovered, he asked to be sent to the front again. He got a purple heart for his wounds, a bronze star for braving Viet Cong sniper fire in order to fix crucial Air Force equipment, and a slew of other decorations. He'd been in the service for 12 years, and there'd been not one complaint of any kind against him. Leonard Maltovich's credentials were impeccable. Frank Kemney invited him to his home in D.C., where they could talk. I'd like you to meet someone, he said. Maltovich was on an assignment at the time in Langley Air Force Base, near Hampton, Virginia. It was a six-hour drive round trip, and Maltovich said he'd be there. The person Kemney wanted him to meet was a married heterosexual, David Adelstone, the UCLA, a UCLA attorney. Adelstone had been a judge advocate in the Air Force, defending people who were being kicked out of the military. Now he was devoting himself to helping Vietnam vets get upgraded on less than honorable discharges, which not only robbed them of veterans' benefits, but also saddled them with a lifetime stigma. Adelstone thought it was high time to tackle the homosexual issue. Long before they finished the first pot of coffee, Adelstone agreed with Kemney. Maltovich would be an ideal test case to challenge the Air Force prohibition on homosexual airmen. The sergeant not only had a sterling record, he was also a straight-looking, squeaky-clean guy who'd blindsided the military's prejudice by coming at them not with a left-wing militant gay activist approach, but with a very all-American apple pie approach. They challenge Air Force Manual 3912, Chapter 2, Section H, Adelson explained. The regulation said, quote, homosexuality is not tolerated in the Air Force, end quote, and it affirmed the Air Force policy of discharging those who engaged or tried to engage in homosexual acts or had homosexual tendencies or associated habitually with persons known to be homosexual. He'd help Maltovich take the challenge all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary. He'd be chief counsel. But Maltovich would need a military lawyer too, who'd serve as assistant counsel. 28-year-old Captain John Larson Janik was recommended as someone not hostile to homosexuality, a rare attribute among military lawyers. Captain Janik advised Maltovich to begin his challenge by writing a straightforward statement to his commander declaring himself a, to be a homosexual. On March 6, 1975, Sergeant Maltovich went to the office of his superior, Captain Dennis Collins, and handed him a letter addressed to the Secretary of the Air Force to be forwarded up the line. May you, maybe you better sit down before you read it, Maltovich told him. The letter announced, as Captain Janik had suggested, that Sergeant Maltovich was homosexual, that his sexual preference in no way interfered with his Air Force duties, and that he was requesting that those provisions in the AFM 3912 relating to the discharge of homosexuals be waived in my case. Those provisions were anyway unconstitutional, Maltovich had added. Captain Collins remained standing as he read it. Maltovich saw the captain's eyes grow, quote, big as basketballs. Then the captain sat down. What the hell does this mean, he asked. 
It means Brown versus the Board of Education, Maltovich answered, because Captain Collins, a black man, would immediately understand. The captain forwarded Maltovich's confession to Lieutenant Colonel Charles Ritchie, commander at Langley. It wasn't long before two men from the Office of Special Investigations, which are like basically the like anti-gay police of the all the military services for like since the 1900s, <laughs> uh, came to see Maltovich. We don't believe it, they told him. You can't have a bronze star and a purple heart and suck cock. To avert... To aver that you can, on April 25th, 1975, Maltovich gave the OSI a written statement detailing that he'd engaged in homosexual acts of fellatio as well as mutual masturbation and anal intercourse in Florida, Louisiana, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. To emphasize that he couldn't be blackmailed into giving away military secrets, he added that he was perfectly open about his homosexuality and that... Family, friends, and co-workers are now aware of my sexual preference. Three weeks later, Lieutenant Colonel Ritchie informed Maltovich that he was initiating action to have him discharged from the Air Force. Air Force. That was exactly what the Maltovich team expected. They blew the story wide open to the media. Frank Kemney was right that an ideal case would get major attention. He worked with scores of discharged service members, but no one like Leonard Maltovich. Even in the heart of his battle with the Air Force, Maltovich never stopped emphasizing every chance he got that his great pride to be an American, to know I'm oppressed, but to be able to stand up there and say so. How could anyone continue to maintain that homosexuals were unfit for military service once they heard the story of this super patriot sergeant? The novelty of Maltovich was irresistible. The New York Times was clearly on his side, describing him as a decorated Air Force career man who'd done three tours of duty in Vietnam and came back with a medal each time. Commander Ritchie's move to have Maltovich discharge was only the opening skirmish in a battle over the definition of a good soldier, the Times reporter observed persistently. At the height of the media frenzy, CBS flew Maltovich to New York in a chartered plane for an interview. He was flown to Chicago to appear on the Phil Donahue show. NBC made a movie. Maltovich versus the Air Force, U.S. Air Force. He was front page news in major newspapers all over the country. Maltovich was deluged with fan mail too. His middle America appeal cut across demographics, as was ex exemplified by a woman who identified herself as very heterosexual North Dakota housewife. You are an attractive man who is honest and explains your beliefs and stands behind them, obviously happy. You could teach my kids in school any day. Don't let the ignorance of others get you down. Right on, the woman wrote. In September 16th, 1975, Maltovich is hearing before an administrative discharge board. His attorney, attorneys called Air Force psychiatrist Dr. Douglas Cheeson, who said he examined Maltovich four times and believed he was fully capable of performing his military duties. They called psychologist John Money, a sexual identity specialist, and Wardle Pomery, who'd worked with Alfred Kinsey on the landmark sexual behaviors book. Both said that Sergeant, the sergeant in no way threatened the heterosexuality of his fellow service members. Homosexuality was not catching, Money said, because sexuality is determined in early childhood. Sergeant Maltovich is extraordinarily stable, Dr. Money testified. He has a history of having stood up under pressure. He's just an unusually stable person. Maltovich's military associates testified too that they knew of his homosexuality and it didn't make any difference in their f friendship. They called him the best there is. They praised his superior leadership and innovative qualities. An excellent teamwork, team worker, performs superbly, has unlimited potential as a career NCO. His unblemished record was presented to the Administrative Discharge Board for its members to contemplate in detail. Even the government's attorneys, Lieutenant Lieutenant, uh, attorney, Lieutenant Colonel James Applegate, couldn't help but be impressed by that record. It was no small thing for the military to lose a serviceman of Maltovich's qualities. Applegate asked him, would you con contract to be celibate, not practice your homosexuality? The Air Force regulation said that if the most unusual circumstances existed, the airman's ability to perform military service has not been compromised. Exceptions to the discharge policy would be made. Applegate seemed to be steering Maltovich to give the panel a reason to do so. But to forswear homosexuality would have defeated Maltovich's main purpose. He asked that he be he, he answered that he was a practicing homosexual and intended to remain so. 
The administrative discharge board deliberated for four hours before they returned around seven o'clock to the crowded hearing room. They declared that the hearing had revealed that Sergeant Maltovich could not be considered a candidate for rehabilitation. Rehabilitated from what, bro? Like, even the, like, okay, in past cases, the psychiatrist would say this person is, like, you know, immoral and unstable and whatever. So there's something they could, like, you know, in their eyes be rehabilitated from. In this, the, like, literally the psychiatrist and everybody was like, no, there's nothing wrong with this guy. He's unusually stable. Rehabilitated from what, bro? <clears throat> Thus, he was unfit for military service. The board recommended he be given a less than honorable discharge. America was celebrating its bicentennial that year. Maltovich, who had a natural instinct for memorable gestures, stepped outside the hearing room to flashing news cameras and a crowd of 40 uniformed airmen who were there to support him. He held up a bicentennial 50 cent piece. It says 200 years of freedom. Maltovich read from the inscription, maybe not in my lifetime, he proclaimed, but we're going to win in the end. Attorney Adelston filed an appeal. It went to the court of the federal judge, Gerard Gessel, a Lyndon Johnson appointee who in 1969 had made one of the very first federal court rulings to uphold a woman's constitutional right to have an abortion. On July 16th, 1976, after recognizing all that Maltovich um, had done for his country, the judge made several astounding pronouncements. It was impossible to escape the feeling that the time had arrived, or maybe imminent, when branches of the armed forces would need to appraise their views on homosexuals in the military service, the judge declared. He pointed out that psychologists, doctors, church leaders, educators were now saying that there is no standard stereotypical homosexual. He criticized the Air Force for ner- knee-jerk reaction and recommended that in light of the increasingly public awareness the and moral would acceptance <sighs> of what is in many respects essentially a matter of private sexual conduct, the military would do well to have a more discriminating and informed approach to the matter. Strong words. They made his conclusion a non sequitur. The judge upheld the right of the Air Force to dismiss Sergeant Meltovich because the Air Force regulation under which he was discharged was not unconstitutional nor arbitrary and capricious. At that point, the ACLU officials dropped the case. The U.S. Supreme Court had been upheld, had just upheld the decision of a Virginia court to retain its sodomy law, and the ACLU saw it as a sign that a further appeal of Leonard Maltovich's case would be useless. But Maltovich couldn't walk away from the fight. Frank Kemney assisted him in finding a former gay activist alliance member, E. Carrington Bogan, who had become a lawyer and had recently... Um, helped to start the Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund. Lambda, still financially wobbly, couldn't take on the case, but Maltovich agreed that he'd raise money for out-of-pocket costs, and Bogan would bring his suit to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. The court, too, couldn't fail to be impressed with Maltovich's military record. The judges wanted to know why the Air Force couldn't somehow fit him into his into its exception for unusual circumstances. On December 6th, 1978, they sent the case back to Judge Gessel to find out why. But rather than explain why, the Air Force actually exercised the exception rule, excised the exception rule from the Air Force manual. Disgusted with the Air Force's intrans- intransigence, the exasperated Judge Gessel ordered Sergeant Leonard Maltovich reinstated immediately. Rather than take Maltovich back, the Air Force offered him a settlement. In return for his resignation, they'd give him $62,000 in back pay, plus $98,000 in compensation, $160,000. It was a lot of money, the equivalent of about $600,000 in today's dollars. Not only not only was so sweet a bundle hard to refuse, Maltovich was afraid that if he ex- accepted reinstatement, the Air Force would trump up other reasons to get rid of him. He'd be left with nothing. <sighs> And while a settlement wasn't a dramatic victory as forcing the military to take an invaded homosexual back (sighs) into the service, he already accomplished a lot. His impeccable record of service had opened a serious dialogue about the ability and the right of gay people to serve in the military, and the Air Force had been shown up for its mistreatment of homosexual service member, and all America had learned that gays come in super patriot flavor too. Frank Kemeny, never one to compromise, was livid 
as Maltovich well at Maltovich's waffling. If Maltovich wouldn't see it through till the end, his case would do nothing to enlighten the military's higher ups. They'd remained Neanderthals, Kemney admonished, but Maltovich took the money. Yeah. Oh. Maltovich's military children. Ensign Vernon, Copy Berg the Third, kind of a fucking name is that, wouldn't take his eyes off of his September 8th, 1975 cover of Time magazine when it's picture of a highly decorated Air Force sergeant behind the bold letter declaration, I'm a homosexual. It crystallized everything for the sandy haired, blue eyed officer. He'd soon be calling himself the Navy's Maltovich. Berg had graduated from Annapolis Naval Academy the year before and had joined the military, the family business. His grandfather, Vernon Berg I, had been a naval officer. His, fa his father, Vernon Berg II, of whom he had said to be an exact copy, hence his nickname, was still a commander in the chaplain corps. Vernon II had earned a bronze star doing battlefield ministering in wounded and dying U.S. Marines during the 1968 Tet Offensive. 23-year-old Copy Berg made his family proud by graduating from Annapolis and getting picked as an assistant chief of staff to a vice admiral um, of the Six Feet Fleet in Gaeta, Gaeta, Italy. From the beginning, though, he and the Navy weren't a good fit. He'd been a star of the Masquerades, an Annapolis drama club, and a lead tenor in the Annapolis Chorus and Glee Club, extracurricular activities that had kept him so busy he failed the course in weaponry and had to repeat it. Aboard ship, Copy Berg didn't hide his disdain for the plebeian mentality of Navy men and ship life, but his disdain didn't make it any less traumatic when a supervisor called him into his office where two men told the Navy Investigation Service awaited him. They told him without preliminaries, we're here to talk about your homosexuality. The startled Berg, who'd had sex with females all through high school and college, thought of himself as bisexual, cried, what homosexuality? Come on now, Mr. Berg, we're not naive, one investigator told him and produced a detailed li list of supposed male partners, professors at Annapolis, midshipmen, other naval officers. It was a fishing expedition. Berg hadn't been intimate with any of them, but the NIS investigators knew he'd had homosexual affairs because they'd just finished Lawrence Gibson, a man with whom Berg had been in a relationship for the past year. Berg was scared. He denied ever having sex with anyone who was a member of the armed forces, though he admitted he'd been with Gibson, a civilian who was employed on a ship as a teacher of English to the Filipino stewards. The NIS men wanted to know Berg's entire sexual history, or rather, only the homosexual parts, all the way back to his high school years. Head spinning, pulse racing, he told them everything. Then they made him sign a statement of what he'd confessed. Two weeks later, Berg was notified that the Navy was starting discharge proceedings against him. He decided to resign and put an end to his misery. Finally, I will be able to pursue my own interests, he wrote to a friend right after handing his superior his resignation. But instead of letting him go, the Navy gave Berg a three-week active duty assignment in the Mediterranean. Then they sent him back to the United States to Norfolk Naval Base to await his trial, even though he'd already resigned. Ensign Berg soon realized that the NIS was tailing him and had bugged his phone looking for evidence that could be used to prosecute him criminally. He concluded that the Navy was seeking to destroy him. It was just at that time, his panic at its height, that he saw the picture of Leonard Maltovich on the cover of Time magazine. It was an epiphany. He wouldn't let the NIS send him into a tailspin, he told Lawrence Gibson. He'd fight like Maltovich was fighting. Gibson, bald and bearded, 15 years older than Berg, had made his living as a teacher, but fancied himself a writer. He cheered his young lover on. Berg would defend his professional record and write to remain an active, on active duty, and Gibson would write a book about it. They'd tell the world. Copy Berg sent, set about developing a political rhetoric. He tested it out on friends. My own battle is one for civil rights. No matter what my position, I'm entitled to fair and equal treatment. In the eyes of the law, he wrote them. Yes, I am a homosexual, he informed his superiors on November 4th, 1975, but I feel strongly that I bring to the Navy talents which are visible, or versatile and unique. He had submitted his letter of resignation, he said, while under duress, and he was hereby withdrawing it. Though he sometimes professed, I am a homosexual only by the definition of the U.S. Navy, and I do not rule out the possibility of heterosexual marriage or fathering children in the future, he also glommed 
onto the political position that sexual persuasions are determined hormonally in the parental stages of human development, or prenatal stages of human development, and the Navy was openly discriminating against a minority who had no more choice as to their preference than they do over their actual sex and skin color. While Copy Berg awaited his hearing, he and Lawrence Gibson moved to New York looking for a gay community. Serendipitously, in a Greenwich Village coffee shop, Berg saw a flyer announcing that a Thanksgiving weekend, the Gay Academic Union would be holding a third annual conference at Columbia University. <sighs> Gays and lesbians who'd been discharged from the military would be conducting a panel. Berg showed up, and during the Q&A, he told his own story. Bill Tom, a lawyer who'd formed the Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund three years earlier, happened to be there, and he came up to Berg soon after as the ensign was finished speaking. Tom handed him a card. Come see me right away, he said. Lambda Legal hadn't yet had a big case, the kind that would bring the organization national attention, but Tom had a hunch that Berg's case would do it. Though Lambda's Carrington... Bogan had been litigating for Maltovich privately. Now the Lambda board had agreed that the organization would take on and pay the cost for Bogan's defense of Ver Vernon Copy Berg. January 19th, 1976. Berg's two-week-long naval administrative hearing began on a miserably cold day. The big fluorescent lit room, hearing room, on the Norfolk Naval Base was packed with reporters waiting to hear the story of the first commissioned naval officer who not only admitted he was a homosexual but also wanted to stay in the service and would argue that it was unconstitutional for the Navy to toss him out. Major TV network crews were there too, setting up lights and cameras. They'd been warned that once the hearing began, no shooting would be permitted. But the case was big news. At least the cameraman could get footage of Berg and his lawyer standing and talking near the defense table, and the five uniformed members of the hearing board parading in and taking their places on a raised platform that was flanked by an American flag to the right and a Navy flag to the left. The expert witness that Carrington Bogan called to take the stand on Berg's behalf told the officer of the administrative hearing board what they didn't want to hear. Vice Admiral William Mack, who'd been superintendent at Annapolis Naval Academy when Berg was a student there, said Ensign Berg had the makings of a fine naval officer. But even more important, the Vice Admiral shared his views that popular opinion about homosexuality has started to evolve. The country is changing. The Navy is not, he admonished the hearing board. Dr. John Money, who'd been an expert witness for Leonard Maltovich, was called by Carrington Bogan to testify in the cases in the Berg case too. Money said he had given Ensign Burke a battery of tests and found him to be perfectly well-adjusted and suited for a naval career. And then he criticized the Navy for its deficit of broad mindedness. Berg ought not to be stigmatized because of his avowed sexuality, the doctor told the Stony Face board. Nor were board members any more responsive to the witness calculated to ruse their rouse their emotions. Commander Vernon Berg II. Copy's father took the stand, decked out in all of his Navy regalia and already showing the signs of cancer he'd got from exposure to Agent Orange, the defoliant used to clear the jungles of Vietnam. Copy Berg had had no idea whether his father would even show up or what he might say. Get out of the service immediately, he's advised Coffee, Copy when he'd heard about what had happened. But now he was there to help his son in his battle for civil rights. He too told the hearing board what it certainly didn't want to hear. Many of the Marines he'd ministered to in Vietnam were gay, Commander Berg declared. Some of them gave their lives for their country. And as a chaplain, he'd met homosexuals from admirals on down. Their homosexuality in no way interfered with their service. One of the five hearing board members, Lieutenant Herbert Artis, a black man, interrupted to say that from his experience, homosexuals aren't accepted by their comrades. They're outcasts. Commander Berg fought him emotionally. Once servicemen know a man, live with him, fight with him, watch friends die with him. What do they care about what he does in his bedroom? It becomes unimportant, like color, he pointed he told the lieutenant, who cut him off with a snarl this time. The regulations say that the Secretary of the Navy is to dismiss homosexuals. They say prompt separation is essential. And before Berg Sr. could answer the board president, Captain Robert Gibson told him he was excused. 
The commander's moving testimony did not move the recalcitrant hearing board. It did have an effect on his own career that was most unfortunate because he dared to say that he knew of homosexual admirals. He was passed over for an expected promotion and virtually drummed out of the military. Expert witnesses and tearful fathers be damned. The administrative discharge board, as I see as the weather, recommended that Ensign Berg be given a less than honorable discharge, no back pay, and no benefits. Before his trouble with the Navy, the Ensign hadn't given a thought to gay and lesbian struggle for civil rights, but his less than honorable discharge and the example of Leonard Maltovich turned him into an impassioned activist. He appealed to a civilian court on the grounds that his, un that his constitutional rights of freedom of association, privacy, and due process had been violated. The case landed again in the district court of the Judge Gerard Gessel, who judged the Maltovich case. Again, Judge Gessel couldn't grant a constitutional right had been violated, but he did tell the Navy, in terms that echoed Vice Admiral Mack, that it had better update its personnel policy to reflect changing scientific knowledge and social standards. Berg and his lawyers thought that promising enough to take their case to the federal appeal, appeal, appeals court, which had even more, which was even more critical of Navy policy. Broad allegations such as homosexuality is incompatible with military service or a person with homosexual tendencies seriously impairs order, good discipline, and morale will no longer suffice, Judge Oscar Davis wrote for the three-man court. The Navy must clarify its standards. Stung by the negative PR, Navy officials adopted a new regulation declaring that service members who committed homosexual acts in the past but showed no proclivity to repeat them could be considered for retention. Ensign Berg could easily have gotten his position back if he were willing to say he'd never do it again. He wasn't. But the judgments of the district court and the federal appeals court seemed to signal the coming of a new day. Navy officials couldn't help but understand that there were loaded cannons aimed at old policies long taken for granted. Rather than try to prove that Ensign Berg's homosexuality would seriously impair, impair order and so on, as the appeals court said it must if it hoped to discharge Berg, the Navy offered him a financial settlement. The money enabled him to pay tuition bills for his MA degree from Pratt Institute of the Arts and begin his career as a graphic artist. Another of Maltovich's offspring who was offered a monetary settlement by the military didn't take the money, and her decade and a half war with the army produced a judicial decree such as Kemeny had long on long sought. Miriam Ben Shalom grew up as a tomboy in rural Wisconsin. In 1974, she was 26 years old, twice divorced, and the mother of a little girl. She called herself a lesbian feminist, though she didn't share lesbian feminism's view of the military as a stronghold of male chauvinist piggery, and she joined the U.S. Army Reserve looking for a career. The colorful Ben Shalom worked as a cultivating worked at cultivating a salty manner. She joked that in the past, she used to say things such as up against the wall, redneck asshole, but she'd mellowed and was now more apt to say up against the wall, you redneck. She was a plausible choice to be named one of the first two women drill sergeants in the 84th training division of the Army, she, Army Reserve. She could bench press 175 pounds and deadlift 400 pounds. So when she was given an all-male squad to drill, the men didn't spend a lot of time questioning her ability. Her valuations as Jill Sargent were superlative. Ben Shalom was a larger-than-life character, attracted to bold gestures. She converted from Roman Catholicism to Judaism, spent several years in Israel, and became an Israeli soldier. Oh my god, I fucking am Facebook friends with this person. Yeah, I'm, I'm Facebook. I, I knew it was the name, but I thought it must be a coincidence. Now that they're saying this, I know it's definitely her. Spent several years in Israel and became an Israeli soldier and citizen and envisioned herself someday joining the U.S. military chaplaincy as a rabbi. When she applied to the Army Reserve, she was asked the routine question about whether she had homosexual tendencies. She claimed to have answered, no, no tendencies. I am one. The recruiting officer ignored Ben Shalom's quip and signed her up. America's role in Vietnam was over, but there weren't legions of people clamoring to enlist. So soon after soldiers had been called baby killers. The next year, in September 1975, Ben Shalom picked up a copy of Time magazine and read about Leonard Maltovich. It was then that she resolved she soon let the world know that there were lesbians in the military too. So when a reporter for her division newspaper interviewed Ben Shalom about her novel position as a woman drill sergeant, 
She didn't hold back. She was a lesbian, she told them. It was the first volley in her war with the military. Her commander, who she claimed later, had always known she was a lesbian and didn't think it was important before, was furious. Well, I couldn't lie, she told him. You should have said no comment, he yelled at her, and he started discharge proceedings. For Ben Shalom, it was the beginning of a drawn-out, tenacious struggle to get back her job and, even more important, convince the world that homosexuality was incompatible with military service. Oh, wasn't incompatible with military service. After she exhausted all possibilities of military appeal, Ben Shalom took her case to the U.S. District Court. She was lucky in her judge, Terrence Evans, who didn't keep it a secret that he'd been raised by a single mother whose humble circumstances were like those of Ben Shalom, who was raising her young daughter alone. Judge Evans was sympathetic to Miriam Ben Shalom from the beginning. Yes, she admitted she was a homosexual, he said in his remark, remarkable May 20th, 1980 judgment, but the army had no proof of her homosexual behavior. The judge proclaimed that his court will not defer to the army's attempt to control a soldier's sexual preference absent of showing actual deviant conduct. But even had the army been able to prove her deviant conduct, Judge Evans continued his rebuke in words that showed he'd been listening to what gay activists were saying. That wouldn't have been sufficient grounds to dismiss Ben Shalom. The army had to change with the times he lectured. Black soldiers were once segregated because racial tensions were feared. Women were once limited to the military roles they could play because sexual tensions were feared. Just as the army had managed to withstand the integration of blacks and women, it would be able to withstand the integration of open homosexuals. But the major declaration in Judge Evans' decision was right out of Frank Kem the Frank Kemeny playbook, exactly what Kemeny had argued after he was discharged from the Army Map Service in 1957. The army has not even tried to show a nexus between Ben Shalom's sexual preference and her military capabilities, Judge Evans scolded. He ordered Miriam Ben Shalom reinstated with all duties, responsibilities, and privileges earned by her prior to her discharge. His soldiers went into one proverbial army ear. His orders went into one proverbial army ear and out the other. When Ben Shalom was still not reinstated by 1983, she filed a motion for contempt of court. But in lieu of reinstating her, the army, like the Air Force in Maltovich's case and the Navy in Berg's case, offered Ben Shalom a bit of money. She refused. In 1986, she took her case back to district court, and again it was ordered that she be reinstated for the remaining 11 months of her three-year enlistment. The recalcitrant army wouldn't budge. It brought the case to the U.S. Court of Appeals. Again, Ben Shalom was lucky in her judge. Walter Cummings' liberal record was solid throughout his career. He opposed his fellow judges who upheld the Boy Scouts regulation that anyone who didn't swear to carry out his duty to God could be excluded from the organization. He ordered steel companies to stop polluting Lake Michigan, and he didn't disappoint in Ben Shalom's case. We are baffled by the Secretary of the Army's confusion over the word reinstatement, Judge Cummings declared with irony in August 1987. The Army had been ordered to reinstate Miriam Ben Shalom with all her duties, responsibilities, and privileges, he reminded John Marsh, the Army Secretary. The order could clearly could hardly be clearer. Clearer. Judge Cummings also reminded Secretary Marsh that Ben Shalom has a First Amendment right to claim she is a lesbian. And he admonished the Secretary to make sure no member of the Army retaliates against Ben Shalom in any way because she was successful in her attempt to gain reinstatement. The next month, Ben Shalom returned to the Army Reserve to finish out the 11 months of her three-year hitch she'd begun 13 years earlier. That was not the end of it for as far as Ben Shalom was concerned. She still had points to make. When her 11 months were up, she tried to enlist again. The Army would not have her. To make sure she'd go away, the Army eventually changed its regulations, which now excluded not just those who behaved homosexually, but to anyone who was an admitted homosexual but as to whom there is no evidence that they have engaged in homosexual acts either before or during military service. Imagine having the military write a fucking law specifically to prevent you as an individual from rejoining the military. Like, fuck, man. Like, they literally wrote the law so she couldn't join. That's crazy. That is, saying that you were homosexual was as much of a non-viable moral administrative disqualification as behaving homosexually. She... 
she would not let those baggy ass old men in the Pentagon, as she dubbed the military brass in an interview with a gay paper, get away with it. She took her case up against the U.S. District Court, and for the third time, she looked out in her judge. Myron Gordon, a Lyndon Johnson appointee, had braved angry popular sentiment a few years earlier by dismissing the case of the Milwaukee 14, who'd been accused of treason because they'd broken into a selective service board and destroyed draft records. He was clearly not afraid of standing up to the military. This time, a judge was actually willing to say that the Army's regulation was unconstitutional. It violated Miriam Ben Shalom's Fifth Amendment right to due process and her Fourteenth Amendment right to equal protection. And just as troubling, it was rationally relega relegated to the advancement of any compelling government interest. Judge Gordon ordered that Ben Shalom be allowed to re-enlist. By 1989, after decades of gay and lesbian activism aimed at expunging old prejudices, attitudes were indeed changing in some areas. The more liberal judges, at least, had been won over. But the army had not. As far as the military was concerned, homosexual, homosexuals were still subversive sicko sinners, just as they'd been in the 1950s. They broke the law and would weaken military morale and fighting readiness. Secretary of the Army John Marsh appealed Judge Gordon's order to re-enlist re Sergeant Ben Shalom. This time, the Army lucked out. The three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals consisted of two Reagan appointees. One would, have, one would pave the way for the enactment of the Illinois law mandating that parents of girls 17 or younger seeking an abortion be notified, while the other jurists consistent low ratings by American bar associations would cause the Bush administration to cease, to cease consulting the ABA about federal judge appointships. The third judge, Harrington Wood, a Gerald Ford appointee, penned the appeals court to finally die hard opinion in the Ben Shalom case. The military should not be required to assume the risk of accepting admitted homosexuals because they might imperil morale, discipline, and the effectiveness of our fighting forces. The three judges refused to buy the idea that Ben Shalom's right to a free speech association or equal protection were being interfered with by the army. She is free to say anything she pleases about homosexuality and about the army's policies toward homosexuality. Judge Wood wrote Wiseacre style, but Ben Shalom cannot do and remain in the army is to declare herself to be a homosexual. Miriam Ben Shalom appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court. I do not believe America will let me down, she told the New York Times and all the other media that would listen. I refuse to give up the privilege to serve my country. SCOTUS refused to hear her case, and the Court of Appeals decision stood. Ben Shalom wouldn't throw away the baggy assed old men in the Pentagon up against the wall by re-enlisting. Yet for lesbians and gay service members, the remarkable opinions of the lower courts that the military had failed to prove a nexus between homosexuality and impaired military performance, or that it had violated homosexuals' constitutional rights, brought a silhouette of the future into eyeshot. Highest ranking officer ever to challenge the armed forces over sexual orientation. Margaret Kammermeyer had never heard of Leonard Maltovich. In 1975 and 1976, when the Air Force Sergeant's case was making headlines, she was Mrs. Harvey Hawkin, serving in the Army Reserve and living with her husband of husband and four sons on a working farm in Maple Valley, 20 miles outside of Seattle. Since the Hawkins didn't have a television or radio and they didn't subscribe to magazines or newspapers, she hadn't heard that homosexuals were demanding rights or that they were even making demands of the military. She couldn't have guessed she'd someday be the center of the struggle. She'd been a nurse at the Army Neurosurgical Intensive Care Unit in Long Bin, Vietnam, during the 60s, and had re-enlisted in the Army Reserve in 1972. Despite her husband's belief that she belonged at home, she performed so well at work that her supervisors couldn't help but notice. In short order, she was promoted to lieutenant colonel and then made assistant chief of the 50th General Army Reserve Hospital at Fort Lawton in Seattle. 
But the 37-year-old Mrs. Hawkin found herself in deep depression. She had to battle a consuming desire to crash her car into a telephone pole. Six feet tall, square-jawed, and with tussled Amelia Earhart hairdo, the fantasy image she'd always had for herself formed in her native Norway should come to America as a nine-year-old was that of a Viking Bruhilda with a sword in hand. She needed a heroic challenge. Her husband, a state patrolman who was a six-foot-six towered over her, needed her to be cooking and cleaning. Her dreams of Sunday becoming a colonel and even a general confounded him and made him more and more domineering and explosive. Instead of ending her life, she started divorce proceedings and took back her own name. The judge, who had recently lost his two sons in a mountain climbing accident, felt more sympathy for a father than for an Amazonian female who stood before him with natural stoic soldier bearing. To Margaret Kemmeyer's anguish, he awarded custody of her four children to her ex-husband. The judge did grant her visitation rights, but whenever she came for her sons, Hawkin, chronically enraged at her, the two most insulting epithets he could think of, dyke and queer, though she'd never had a sexual relationship with a woman. Oh, hey, Claire, you're on both things. <clears throat> Kammermeyer tamped down her emotions and carried on, becoming chief nurse of an Army Reserve Evacuation Hospital, writing research papers for the Journal of Military Medicine, setting up a major training hospital for field operations, receiving the Reverend's Administration's first Nurse of the Year Award in 1985. Two years later, she was promoted to colonel, and in 1988, she became chief nurse of the Washington National Guard and was halfway through her PhD program in nursing at the University of Washington. She was too busy for much of her personal life, but when friends introduced her to Diane Devil Bess, a lesbian artist and art professor, Camemire was smitten as she'd never been with a man. For the first time at the age of 46, she saw herself as a lesbian. Romantic, bith, uh, romantic bliss with Devil Bess didn't obviate professional ambition, of course. The prize on which Colonel Karameyer had her eye and for which she was eminently qualified was the position of National Chief Nurse of the Army Nurse Corps. To get that job, the colonel needed to attend the war college. That meant she'd have to upgrade her security clearance to top secret. It seemed a mere detail. She'd put in her application for an upgrade. A Defense Investi Investigative Service Special Agent Brent Troutman called her in a few weeks to say he could schedule the routine interview. It'll only take 45 minutes, he, turned, he told Colonel Kammermeyer. Military women who'd long lived as lesbians knew what and how to camouflage, but Margaret Kammermeyer, a lesbian naif, 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 whatever, didn't quite understand that now there was a part of her life that she must hide. Later, she'd vaguely remember that when she went through basic training in 1963, her group was told something about homosexuality being incompatible with military service. But that had had nothing to do with her. If she'd ever had a lesbian thought of herself, she pushed it aside until she met Diane Divelbess. Kammermeyer jotted, Kammermeyer jotted down the appointment with Special Agent Troutman in her agenda book, April 28th, 1989, 45 minutes, starting at 11 o'clock. Before the interview... She could see patients and run her clinic on epilepsy seizures. After, on her one-hour lunch, she could meet with the real estate agent to sign final papers for the larger house she just purchased so her elderly, widowed father could join the household. Um, okay. <laughs> The tight space, bare walls, and high windows that gave the basement office of the VA hospital the feel of a dungeon, none of it registered with Kammermeyer for the first half of her interview. Agent Troutman, a pleasant-looking man in a dark business suit, sat across from her at a long table and asked her routine questions that he heard that he read from a list, nodding amiably and checking boxes as she answered. In the same disinterested voice he'd been using, he asked the next question, his pen poised to check the no box. Did you ever engage in homosexual acts? She had no occasion to track the military's variable policy on homosexuality. When she served in Long Bin during the Vietnam War, she was pretty sure there'd been lesbian nurses in her hospital, and no one had moved to kick them out of the nursing corps. She'd assumed if she thought of it at all, that what matters 
Still, was a homosexual individual's useless usefulness in the military? Yes, I'm a lesbian, she told Agent Troutman with her usual directness. It was a top-secret clearance, and she didn't want to lie. She didn't know that in 1981, soon after the Pentagon lost its battle with Leonard Maltovich, and with no war going on that made it essential to keep trained service members serving, the Defense Department had passed a new directive, 1332.14, it called for total exclusion from the armed forces of all homosexuals, no exceptions. Troutman stopped reading from his list of questions. Kammermeyer's breath caught at the change in his look. It was like somebody had just given him a piece of pie, she thought. How many women have you had sex with, he asked. Who are the other lesbians you know? Even his voice changed. He craved details, specifics. His probing went on and on for the next five hours. Is this for your own curiosity, your own pleasure, she wondered. She considered herself traditionally Norwegian. Talk of sex was repugnant to her. She kept emphasizing to Troutman her emotional connection to her partner. Troutman finally let her leave at five o'clock after he typed up a statement of subject in which Colonel Kammermeyer disclosed her lesbianism. He demanded she sign it. She insisted he include in her disclosure the statement, I want the government to see me as a human being, not a woman who has sex with other women. She also hand wrote on it, lesbianism is an orientation I have, emotional in nature, towards women. It does not imply sexual activity. In retrospect, the colonel couldn't pinpoint the exact moment at which she knew she was in trouble. For the next month, she waited. Nothing happened. She felt like she was sitting on a powder keg and she couldn't see whether someone was hovering with an open flame in october her commander state surgeon colonel george Koss, who championed her promotion encouraged her national chief nurse ambition and knew her to be the best of soldiers called her into his office and regretfully informed her he'd been ordered by the department of the army to start the procedure for discharging her are you sure you didn't make that statement under duress he asked hopefully Maybe you were just having a bad day. No, she answered. I'm a lesbian. She wouldn't disavow her newfound understanding of who she was. Dr. Koss delayed his discharge report. He selected her to be the Washington State Representative to a National Guard conference in Arkansas. She continued working closely with him on plans for recruiting and training personnel for New Washington National Guard Hospital. But finally, Koss's commander completed the investigation of Kammermeyer and turned in the report. In March 1991, she was informed that the Army was withdrawing its federal recognition, which had tantamount, which tantamount to discharge. It was as though all her years of service, even the bronze star she'd gotten for heroism in Vietnam, all of it had been negated. And she'd not only be stripped of her rank, she'd lose her salary, life insurance, medical coverage, everything. She never doubted what she needed to do. She'd take the military, the huge monster to whom she'd pay loving fealty her whole life. Or she'd take on the, mon the military, the huge monster to whom she'd paid loving fealty her whole adult life. It might kill her, she explained to Diane Devilbess, with whom she now lived, but she wouldn't drop her sword. Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund happily took Colonel Kammermeyer's case and put the team together a team of half a dozen attorneys led by a young military law expert, Mary Newcomb. They demanded an administrative hearing. It was scheduled for July 1491, the 13th anniversary to the day of when a 19-year-old Margaret Margaret III was sworn into the military. Oh, 30th. Fuck, man. It's a long time to serve. The hearing room at Kim Murray headquarters for the Washington National Guard was in a building that looked like a World War II bunker, with dingy walls and scant lighting. The administrative hearing board of five colonels heard expert witnesses testify homosexuality wasn't catching, that hundreds of thousands of homosexuals, undetected, had served well in the military. The board received into the record a copy of a letter that the governor of Washington state, Booth Garner, wrote in defense of Secretary Dick Cheney, protesting a senseless end to a career by a distinguished longtime member of the armed services. Dr. Koss and others from Kammermeyer's un unit testified that her work was exemplary and crucial, and that the unit's morale had been in no way affected by the, by the knowledge that she was a lesbian. Her oldest son, now married, 
and her daughter-in-law, both Mormons, testified that they knew of her homosexuality and that she was a loved member of their family. Kammermeyer, dressed in her most formal uniform with all her medals on display, testified that her professional career, her abilities, her contributions have nothing to do with my sexual orientation. The five colonels deliberated only for half an hour before they called Margareth Cambermeyer back into the hearing room. It was the job of the board president, Colonel Patsy Thompson, who'd been a chief nurse of the National Guard Bureau, to read the verdict. I truly believe you are one of the great Americans, Margareth Thompson began, and talked about her great admiration for all Cambermeyer had done for the Army National Guard and how proud they were of her and her accomplishments. Thompson then read testimonies that young nurses had submitted to the hearing board about what a fine role model Kammermeyer had been and how well she had led and inspired others and how she was one of the few members of the unit who knew anything about being an officer. Before Colonel Thompson finally read the board's verdict, she choked up. It was her sad duty, she said in a quavering voice, to announce that though Kammermeyer had been a great asset to the military and to the medical profession, and though she'd consistently provided superb leadership and has many outstanding accomplishments to her credit. She was an admitted homosexual, and therefore army regulations demanded that she, that the board recommend she be discharged. Marguerite Kammermeyer had dreamed throughout the two-day hearing, when so much praise was heaped on her, that the board would be swayed to make an exception to military policy. But lawyer Mary Newcomb, who'd studied the administrative board hearings of Maltovich, Berg, Ben Shalom, Perry Watkins, Dusty Pruitt, Keith Meinhold never believed the five colonels capable of leaping over the hidebound regulations. She didn't wait for the verdict to read to ready an appeal to the civilian court. District Court Judge Thomas Zilly rendered his decision in 1994. He observed that what was obvious, all the evidence showed that Colonel Kammermeyer was an outstanding officer and army nurse, and the government policy that mandated her discharge was based solely on prejudice. There was no rational relationship, no nexus, between the military's regulation against homosexuality and a legitimate government purpose. The claim that because of her homosexuality, she dec the decorated and dedicated Colonel Kammermeyer somehow interfered with the military's ability to maintain readiness and combat effectiveness was clearly preposterous. Moreover, Judge Zilly declared there wasn't and must never be a military exemption to the Constitution. The military had violated Colonel Kammermeyer's constitutional right to equal protection and due process. He ordered that she be reinstated to her former position, that the military expunge all records of her sexual orientation. The Department of, De of Defense did what it had done in all the other cases in which the district court judges found the military policy on homosexuality, homosexuals to be irrational. It appealed. It asked that the district court's decision be struck from the books, but the Ninth District Court of Appeals had heard the case in 1995, refused to do that. Wait, what? Had heard the case in 1995, refused to do that. Margareth Kammermeyer, already back at the National Guard Hospital, continued to serve until she retired in 1997. For two decades since Leonard Maltovich first declared that he was a homosexual and wished to keep serving in the military, civilian courts had been reiterating the exact the same point. Exclusion of homosexuals from the armed forces was based on nothing but prejudice. It had nothing to do with preserving fighting readiness or unit cohesion or anything else with which the military needed to be concerned. Stereotypes about homosexuals as security threats and moral weaklings had lost their currency, the civilian court judges were saying. It was a powerful affirmation of the gay and lesbian movement's tremendous progress in challenging bigotry. The judges were comparing the military's bias against homosexuals to its earlier bias against blacks. In language sometimes respectful and sometimes rebuking, the judges were telling the military it had no right to violate the constitutional rights of American citizens. The country was changing, the judges said, and it was time that the military changed along with it. The man elected president in 1992, in the midst of Colonel Kammermeyer's case, believed that the military was finally ready to listen. He was wrong. Oh, it's about Clinton. Okay. 
I'm gonna go get a drink. I'll be right back, and then I'll keep reading the next chapter. Chair squeaky. I'm going to switch chairs. So this is chapter 27. Oh wait. 26 out of 32. So definitely approaching the end of the book. I want to see how long this chapter is to prepare myself psychologically. It's not bad. 17 pages. It's about as long as the last chapter, so I think it'll be like about 11 when I'm done reading. Wait. I don't fucking know. I was estimating before and now I've stopped. I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> chapter 26. Don't ask, don't tell, don't serve. Fuck, who could have predicted this? Dude, you think I've been reading long? I've been reading since 6.30. I just switched books. <laughs> I was I was reading, um, I read uh, like a chapter of, oh no, wait. Okay, so I read a chapter of a lesbian book. Um... this sophistries the global history of lesbianism because this book is super male centric like like i would say at most a quarter of it has been about lesbians and then i streamed for like 45 minutes just like giving my thoughts and opinions on what i had read in the book so far and then i like got a drink and went to the washroom and then i was like next stream um yeah i think i'm just gonna do it all on youtube now I don't, I don't think I'm going to leave these ones up, though, because it feels weird to leave, like, the end of a book up without the rest of the book. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 26. Don't ask, don't tell, don't serve. The most pro-lesbian and pro-gay ticket in history. May 18th, 1992. The event at the Palace, a showy Hollywood venue that jumped with rock concerts on the weekends, took place 
on a workday evening, but it was as celebratory as the 4th of July, flashing red and white and blue neon lights framing the stage and lighting up the six-foot-tall letters of the name Clinton, 76 trombones and stars and stripes forever, loudly blaring, the, thr the throng wildly cheering. David Mixner, who'd been a friend of Bill Clinton since 1969 when Mixner organized the moratorium to end the war in Vietnam, had been appointed the National Executive Committee of the, Clin of the Clinton for President campaign. The first openly gay person ever to serve on such a high-profile committee. I think Mixner did something with one of the, like, maybe the Texas political caucus. or No, probably the Hollywood. There was, like, some gay political caucus that I think he, like, either consulted for or was a part of. Um... It was he who'd invited his old friend and introduced him to the audience of 600 gays and lesbians who could afford to pay $180 apiece for a ticket to the Clinton for President fundraiser. This was the biggest presidential rally yet in the gay and lesbian community. It's because of Bill Clinton, Mixner announced with feeling, that I'm allow allowing myself to dream again. When Clinton became president, he'd do for gays and lesbian civil rights what Harry Truman, John Kennedy... And Lyndon Johnson had done for the civil rights of other minorities, David Mixner solemnly promised. That the governor of Arkansas and candidate for the presidency of the United States had agreed to attend a gay and lesbian fundraiser was wondrous enough. Just four years earlier, another Democratic candidate for president, Michael Dukakis, had turned down a gay group's offer to raise a cool $1 million for his campaign because the group wanted Dukakis to publicly acknowledge its support. But while Bill Clinton would tell his entranced gay and lesbian audience made the event even more wondrous. It was breathtaking. I have a vision for the future, and you are a part of it, he said. You represent a community of our nation's gifted people that we've been willing to squander. We can't afford to waste the capacities, the contributions, the hearts and souls and minds of the lesbian and gay community. If he were elected president, he vowed, not only would he make the war on AIDS with an effort so extensive it would vie with the Manhattan Project, big research budget, AIDS education for all of America, appointment of an AIDS czar who'd oversee it all, but he'd also make sure that gays and lesbians got federal civil rights protections, and he swore to the applauding, to the applauding whistling crowd he'd end the ban on gays and lesbians serving in the military. Thousands of red, white, and blue balloons descended from the ceiling as people cheered till they were hoarse. They weren't the first of to whom Clinton said he'd end the gay and lesbian ban. In 1991, after Clinton decided to run for the presidency, he'd approached gay congressman Barney Frank for an endorsement. Okay, Frank said, then asked Clinton if he'd pledge to let gays and lesbians serve openly. That sounds like a good idea, Clinton had answered. In October of that year, Clinton spoke to Harvey Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where he promised that if elected, he'd eliminate the military's discriminatory policies against gays with a stroke of the pen. He'd sign an executive order, just as Harry Truman did in 1948, when he banned military discrimination against black service members. The Republicans pounced on Clinton's province. At the Republican National Convention in August 1992, Patrick Buchanan, keynote speaker, told delegates who'd conveyed, convened in the Houston Astrodome that homosexuals were touting Clinton and his running mate, Al Gore, as the most pro-lesbian and pro-gay ticket in history. Clinton and Gore were cheating a battle for the soul of America, he bemoaned as Republican delegates punctuated his remarks by waving signs proclaiming, thank God for AIDS. Family rights forever. Gay rights never. This is a culture war. Okay, I get that they're homophobic and everything, but how can you literally, like, if you're any kind of elected official of, like, the American people. You shouldn't be, like, cheering for the deaths of any American people. And also, I ranted about this before, like, literally, when the AIDS shit starts happening in this book, the conservatives are like, 
this isn't just affecting the gays. Like, God is punishing the gays, but it's also, like, blowing back on us, the heterosexuals, right? Like, obviously, right? And still, for, like, a decade or whatever, they wouldn't put any money into AIDS research or AIDS education or whatever. And it's, like, same fucking thing. You think the only people who are dying of AIDS are the gays? Like, thank God for a AIDS. What about the wives of the closeted gay men who caught it? Or just, like, the drug users who caught Like, just, like, there are a lot of people fucking caught AIDS that weren't just gays, you know? Like, what the fuck, man? I'm not even American. This shit pisses me off. Okay, anyway. Like, if you are, like, a fucking public servant, like, elected to, like, represent fucking Americans, you shouldn't be cheering on when Americans are dying. It's, like, basic, you know? Whatever. Okay. The lines have been drawn. At the Democratic Convention in Madison Square Gardens, Clinton wasn't hesitant to broadcast his support of gays and lesbians, even his intention to end the military ban. He arranged spots on the program for his environmental advisor, Bob Hattoy, an openly gay man with AIDS, and Roberta Ardenberg, co-founder of the National Center for Lesbian Rights and a mover and shaker in Calif Clinton's California campaign. Hattoy and Ardenberg addressed the convention not at five in the morning, as Jim Foster and Madeline Davis had done in the 19th, in 1972. They went to a Democratic National Convention in 1972, to try to say, like, basically to be, like, you need to acknowledge gay civil rights. And they were, like, booed out of the place. People were, like, yelling at them and stuff. And, like, they didn't get to speak until five in the morning. So even the people who were there, like, didn't, like, there was barely anybody left to listen to them at that point anyway. Um, anyway. But during prime time, TV cameras panned the sea of rainbow flags and bold letter signs demanding lesbian and gay rights now. As Hattoy told America that lesbians and gays were part of the American family, and Bill Clinton sees the value of each and every member of the American family. Actenberg told America that the time had come for equal treatment in civilian employment and in the military also. She had been on the Democratic Party's platform drafting committee, too, where she'd spearheaded the party's adoption of, gay right, of the, a gay rights plank, that included an end to Defense Department discrimination. Bill Clinton, no George McGovern, who'd made secret promises to gays and canceled them in the light of day, openly embraced the plank, including its call for the military to treat gays and lesbians fairly. Clinton had done his research, of course, and it seemed practically certain that the Pentagon itself was, or soon would be, concluded, concluding that the armed services needed to stop discriminating against homosexuals. He learned of the 1988 report that had been ordered by the Office of the Secretary of Defense and conducted, conducted by a distinguished research psychologist and a military psychiatrist for the Personnel Security Research and Education Center, PERSEREC, at Arm of the Pentagon. The report left no doubt about what the military ought to do with regard to gays and lesbians in the armed forces. The authors of the report reminded the Secretary of Defense that in recent years, the federal court had been ruling that the military's discrimination against homosexuals was unconstitutional. The justices had been comparing discrimination against gays and lesbian service members to discrimination against black service members before President Truman integrated the military. The justices had also been making the military pay out big money to settle homosexual discrimination suits. Moreover, the writers of the report admonished the Secretary of Defense the Civil Service Commission had declared more than 15 years earlier that no person would be denied federal employment on the basis of sexual orientation. And in 1988, the Veterans Administration had been forced to give full benefits to those who'd been discharged on the grounds of homosexuality. Any discrimination against gays and lesbians that was still going on in the military floated not only the courts and the Constitution, but the government's policies as well. The author also cited earlier studies, such as the 1957 Crichton-Den report, which concluded that homosexuals were less of a security risk than alcoholics, promiscuous heterosexuals, and people with marked feelings of inferiority who must brag of their knowledge of secret information. That was cited, the 1971 Colin J. Williams and Martin S. Weinberg study, uh, that concluded that having a same gender or opposite gender orientation is unrelated to job performance as it is to being left-handed or right-handed. And they cited a study that was ordered by Perserec 
and would be published the following year, which found that homosexual military homosexuals military sustainability related adjustment is as good or better than that of the average heterosexual. Finally, the report's authors reminded the Secretary of Defense in the recent past We've learned how to integrate racial and other minority groups into nearly every aspect of political and social life. And that could and should be done with regard to homosexuals too. Social attitudes towards homosexuality have been shifting, the authors emphasized. The decades long struggle of gays and lesbian rights movements had made a decent, had made a dent. Homosexuals were no longer the pariahs they once were. It would be impossible to read this report and not conclude that it was high time the military got with the program and ceased witch hunting and discharging homosexual service members. Bill Clinton certainly came to such a conclusion. And because the report had been ordered by the Department of Defense and conducted by one of its arms, he'd assumed the military leaders would perceive would be receptive to its recommendations. They weren't. Bye, Claire. There's no question that Clinton made his promise to gays and lesbians in good faith. As soon as he took office, he was ready to grab a pen and sign the executive order. At his first press conference, he told the media that he intended to do what he intended to do. But he'd never served. During the Vietnam years, when males his age were being drafted, he received a deferment as a Rhodes Scholar. And he knew little about military culture. He hadn't imagined the opposition he'd get from the Joint Chiefs of Staff when he told them that recruiters should no longer ask about an applicant's sexual preference and that discharges of homosexual service members should be suspended. Led by General Colin Powell, the first African-American chairman, the Joint Chiefs threatened to resign en masse if Clinton forced the gay issue upon them. General Powell had expressed disapproval of Clinton's plan even before the Clinton won the election. Pat Schroeder, a Democratic representative from Colorado, read about the general's opposition in the summer of 1992. I am sure you are aware that your reasoning would have kept you from the mass hall a few decades ago, she wrote to chastise him. But Powell insisted there was no parallel between homosexuals and blacks. Skin color is benign, non behavioral, is a benign non behavioral characteristic, he answered the Congresswoman Schroeder. Homosexuality is a behavioral issue. Yeah, but it's not like you're being homosexual when you're like shooting at people or whatever the fuck people do in the military. Homosexual referred not to people but acts. The chief of naval operations, the Marine Corps commander, and the army chief of staff all agreed with General Powell that those acts couldn't be kept off of military bases if the people who indulged in them were tolerated. They'd be distracting and would destroy fighting readiness. They'd be divisive and would destroy unit cohesion and morale. The far right rallied over the issue, as it had been doing for decades, whenever it seemed that gays would be given a civil right. As soon as word got out about the president's intentions, the Christian right began orchestrating massive church campaigns to inform him and all of Washington about their displeasure. They flooded congressional offices with tens of thousands of letters pleading that the ban not be lifted lest the, na the nation's fighting forces be destroyed by perverts. Most of the objectors preferred to deliver their messages via telephone. During eight days in early February, soon after Clinton's announcement announced his intention to keep his promise to lesbians and gays, the Capitol switchboard logged 1,650,143 calls, mostly from people... Um, saying that his plan endangered the country. To emphasize their horrors at the prospect of open homosexuals in the service, the Family Research Council, which is like one of those pro-family, anti-gay organizations, which is like huge with like a lot of funding and power and stuff, made sure that every U.S. congressman got a copy of its video, The Gay Agenda, which included such gems as the defrocked psychologist Paul Cameron declaring that 80% of homosexual men ingest human feces. What the fuck? But it wasn't only the Christian right that urged eternal banning of homosexuals from the military. Senate Minority Leader Bob Dole threatened that if Clinton signed an executive order ending the ban, 
the Republicans would offer its reinstatement as an amendment to the Family and Medical Leave Act, a high priority bill for labor and women, two of Clinton's largest constituencies. Maine Senator George Mitchell and Senate Majority Leader from Clinton's own party warned the new president that a non binding resolution that upheld the homosexual ban would pass the Senate 70 to 30. It would be a huge embarrassment to his new presidency. The head of the Senate Armed Service Committee, Georgia Democrat Sam Nunn, also admonished Bill Clinton about his bad judgment. To keep homosexuals out of the military is not prejudice, it's prudence, Nunn declared. Clinton's advisors panicked. They thought from the start that the issue was dangerous and regretted Clinton's commitment. A high-profile defeat in the early days of administration would be disastrous, they told him, and this issue was hardly central to his program for the nation. He must slow down, they said, but Clinton's public publicly restated his intention to end the ban. Before his first week in office was over, he asked his Secretary of Defense, Les Aspen, to draft the executive order. His worried secretary pleaded with him not to be so precipitous. The executive order could be postponed for six months. Aspen would hold extensive consultations with all branches of the service. Then he'd draft an order incorporating their requirements. Clinton gave Secretary Aspen permission to consult with the chiefs. Secretary Aspen had become a U.S. representative from Wisconsin in 1971. From 1985 until he accepted the position as Clinton's Secretary of Defense, he served as chair of the House Committee on Armed Services. For eight years, he worked closely with the Joint Chiefs of Staff so he could guess their response to Clinton's extraordinary notion. He held the meeting with the Chiefs in the Tank, a soundproof chamber on the second floor of the Pentagon. It was good that the chamber was soundproof because the two-hour meeting was stormy. Maybe not coincidentally, Aspen was hospitalized soon after with a cardiac problem. Jesus fucking Christ. There was no way that the Joint Chiefs of Staff could agree to support a charge in the section of the Uniform Code of Military Service of justice that made sodomy a crime, they told the secretary. Clinton, they believed, was an elitist civilian official, totally out of touch with the realities of military life. Yeah, but it's like, okay, imagine that being gay is actually legal in the military, you know, like it is today. Do you think that they're just gonna, like, start screwing, like, in the, in their bunks when everybody is asleep, like, because it's legal? Or that there would be so many gays that they would all be, like, in the same unit sleeping in the same place. Like, I just can't even understand what the actual problem is. Like, how... Like, what is the actual pro... You know what I'm saying? Okay. Um, I'm going to turn on the heat because I'm fucking cold. One sec. <clears throat> oh, there's not really any reason for me to have headphones on because I'm just listening to myself talk. I don't need to listen to myself talk. I can hear it with my own ears. Okay, one sec. My heater's under the desk. It's annoying. Okay. An honorable compromise. I think that's a bit stretching the word honorable, to be honest. Finally, the chiefs, the secretary, and the president did agree they'd listen to the hearings that the Senate Armed Service Committee would hold on the advisability of letting homosexuals serve. March 23, 1993, six days before the Senate hearings were scheduled to begin, Clinton and his advisors had a bright idea. There could be certain restrictions on homosexual service members. They wouldn't be allowed to go to combat. They'd be restricted to serve from some other jobs too. They could serve in separate units, pre-1948 all over again, even have separate barracks. Well, if you gave them separate barracks, then they would actually be like hooking up and stuff, probably. 
It can be easily imagined that proposal was as infuriating to all sides as it deserved to be. Those opposed to homosexuals in the military complained that such a scheme condoned sodomy by allowing homosexuals to serve, just as bad homosexuals would be taking non-combat jobs from heterosexuals, thus giving heterosexuals a bigger chance of ending up in the risky combat. My god, make up your fucking mind, people. Gay groups objected that banning lesbians and gays from combat and other important military jobs would doom them to an unequal career path. Tom Stoddard, a Manhattan lawyer and coordinator of the newly formed Campaign for Military Services, funded by gay Hollywood mogul David Geffen, complained, This is no compromise. This is capitulation to the other side. The segregation plan was scuttled. Congressman Barney Frank came up with a more plausible proposal. On base, off base, he called it. On base while you're on duty. You don't talk about your homosexuality and don't let it show. Off base, you live your life, he proposed to General Powell. I could accept that, Powell said, but I wouldn't want to be the only member of the Joint Chiefs in favor of it. Powell took the idea to the other chiefs who couldn't be budged. The Senate Armed Service Committee hearings were held as scheduled. They began on March 29, 1993. Those who liked the band stole the show. The media made a minority's war out of the testimonies of service members they identified as being from groups that had been discriminated against in the past, quoting them as avowing the importance of keeping discrimination in place against homosexuals. A black sailor said he resented equating homosexuality with civil rights. A Hispanic sailor said he'd mutiny if the ban were lifted. A female naval instructor said there are a lot of reasons to keep people out of the service, including flat feet. The hearings also feature testimonies such as that of retired Amy Lieutenant General C.A.H. Waller, who'd been a deputy commander of the U.S. forces in the Persian Gulf War. Waller told the committee that allowing homosexuals to serve in the military would make America's armed, first, armed forces second rate. Why? Because openly avowed homosexuals want to foist their lifestyle upon soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines. But bro, all of the whole high-profile gay military people up till now have been very like non-gay militant types so like what the fuck are they even talking about and like everybody has acknowledged up to this point that there are tons of gays in the military they just like keep everything secret <sighs> herbert hart spokesman for the reserve Arf office association declared that his organization wanted it known that the mission of a military isn't social experimentation. It's to go to war and fight and die if necessary. If you have an individual who has a different type of lifestyle than this, it's going to affect the cohesion of the unit. But bro, if they fucking signed up for the military, obviously they're willing to die for their country. None of this even makes, like, I'm not, I'm, like, actually, like, against the military, but just none of this makes any fucking sense, man. Representatives from various gay organizations... And Morgan Thau Kammermeyer, the only lesbian invited to testify about her experience, argued that homosexual service members are military people first. They're in the military to do their jobs, not to force their sexuality on their straight comrades. Their testimony made no dent. It was clear where Senator Nunn stood halfway through the hearings when he pointed out that if someone admitted to being a homosexual, he or she was starting was stating a basic tendency, at least to breach the sodomy statute, which the Supreme Court had upheld seven years earlier in Bowers versus Hardwork. None was making sure everyone understood that the president was asking the military to let criminals serve. As though more were needed, the leading American military sociologist, Charles Moskos, a professor at Northwestern, came up with facts and figures about why homosexuals should be banned from the service. Moskos testified that he and his PhD student, Laura Miller, had surveyed 946 military men and women. 78% of the men and 47% of them women opposed to ending the ban. 90% of the men would feel uncomfortable sharing a room with a gay. 47% of the non-commissioned officers said they'd leave the service if the ban were lifted. A few years earlier, Senator Nunn had worked with Professor Moscos to, dry up, to draw up a Citizenship and National Service Act. The legislation would have mandated that no one could receive a federal grant or loan for education 
before serving the country, either in the military or through some sort of national service job, such as street cleaner, hospital orderly, policeman, or tutor. Wags compared it to the Hitler judgment. What? The Hitler jugend, in which male adolescents were forced into service for the fatherland. Oh my god. The proposal couldn't pass Congress in the stringent form that Dr. Moscow's designed, but he and none remained friends. The barrel-chested, plain-spoken Moscow's, he called himself a short, fat, bald Greek, had made his name by interviewing soldiers in the field in Vietnam and writing articles about how racial integrity had benefited the army. Oh, racial integration had benefited the army. Never one to modulate his pronouncements, Moscow's often gave out such a wild generalization as in the volunteer army, you're recruiting the best of the blacks and the worst of the whites. None had hired his professor friend to get empirical data on the matter of homosexuals in the military, hence Moscow's survey. Now Moscow's offered his expertise as a military sociologist to write a proposal about homosexuality and military service the military leaders could live with. The fervent champion of a racially integrated army was no champion of integration when it came to gays and lesbians. Shocking. It would be hard for the morale if homosexuals served openly, Moscow's believed. Heterosexual soldiers have a right not to be inescapably confronted with intimate gay behavior, the professor reported to Sam Nunn. To me, the issue comes down to privacy. Prudes have rights too, Moscow's quip to newspaper reporters with his usual flipping good humor. As if all of the men in the military are prudes. They're known for, like, basically, like, keeping prostitution afloat in some countries. <sighs> Nevertheless, he opined, all young people were obliged to serve their country, and gays and lesbians were no exception. They ought to serve, but they must keep who they are a secret. They must never be caught doing or even hoping to do what makes them homosexual. He dubbed the policy he proposed, don't ask, don't tell, don't seek, don't flaunt. Sure, it's a bit of hypocrisy, Moscow admitted to the media, but hypocrisy is necessary now and then in a civil society. President Clinton, having suffered the disaster of the Senate Armed Service Committee hearings and being worn out by the struggle over the over gays that kept him from turning his attention to the mounting budget deficit and the growing warfare welfare roles wanted the astounding flap to be over even at the cost of making compromise making a compromise with bigotry he accepted moscow's proposed policy the pentagon in turn accepted a chance a change in the uniform code of military service Service members with a homosexual identity wouldn't be kicked out as long as they didn't talk about it or get caught acting or seeking to act on it on or off base. Wait. I thought that's more strict than I thought it was. I thought they could like do what they wanted off base as long as it wasn't like super public. Okay, well. The Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy went into effect on July 19th, 1993. Clinton declared it to be an honorable compromise. The consummate politician, he touted his failed effort as though it was his triumph, announcing this is an end to witch hunts that have spent millions of taxpayer dollars to ferret out individuals who have served their country well. That particular sop for gays and lesbians and their supporters. Speaking about the new policy to high-ranking officials at the, at the National Defense University in D.C., he adopted the military's leader's usual rhetoric about the dangers of open homosexuality, which he said Don't Ask, Don't Tell would prevent. We must and will protect unit cohesion and troop morale, President Clinton emphasized. Fourteen months earlier, David Mixner had listened with happy tears in his eyes. As the president candidate told the gays and lesbians gathered at the Hollywood Palace, I have a vision for the future and you are part of it. Now, soon after Don't Ask to Tell became official, Mixner and about 20 other people who'd been at the Clinton fundraiser chained themselves to the White House fence in protest. They were carted off to jail by the D.C. Park Police. Don't Ask, Don't Tell in action. Great. This is going to be depressing. 
One sec, I have to close my door. My cat has opened it. Don't ask, don't tell, might have seemed a polite and innocuous accommodation to both sides. Gay and lesbian service members would be discreet and the military would be restrained and not inquire into private lives. But in practice, it didn't work that way. Shocking. The mere existence of the policy was repugnant to all gays and lesbians in the military or out of it. It confirmed the stigma against which the movement had been fighting for decades. It made explicit that homosexuality, to the military at least, was still so disgraceful that it remained, despite all the hard-won ev- advances, the love that dare not speak its name. In the beginning of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, years, the military made an effort to show that the policy worked. Bridget Wilson, a lesbian lawyer and vice president of the Dignity, of Dignity, a national Catholic LGBT organization, migrated from Omaha to San Diego in the early 70s, and in the Navy town, she found herself with a large clientele of gay and lesbian soldiers. They were being discharged, often en masse, and wanted a civilian lawyer to help them in their battle. She was soon specializing in military law. Before Don't Ask, Don't Tell, Wilson did a lot of witch hunt fighting against the Naval Investigative Service. When Don't Ask, Don't Tell was first adopted, it seemed to Wilson for a little while that the military really might finally become more reasonable. In early 1994, a few months after the policy went into effect, a Navy officer came to Richard Wilson asking for help. A classic manly man, he was a Naval Academy graduate and had served for more than 10 years without arousing a single suspicion that he was gay. He was perfectly willing to honor the new policy too. So when he was told by a San Diego hospice doctor that his partner, who had AIDS-related pneumonia, won't get through the weekend, he went to the ship's captain to request a two-day leave. My aunt is dying, he said, because he wasn't supposed to tell. We don't give time off for aunts, the captain informed him. That was when the distraught officer said, You don't have to give me leave, but I'm going to leave. I have no choice. And he told. He was soon called up before the Navy Board of Inquiry, which voted to discharge him under the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. Bridget Wilson pleaded his case in a military appeals court. Though DADT had been in effect for only a little over six months, lawyers arguing for gay and lesbian service members had already been saying that it was unconstitutional because there was no way to fight a discharge under it, regardless of the circumstances. Anxious to show that DADT was a reasonable policy that could work, the Navy Appeals Court rescinded the officer's discharge. But as Wilson learned, military anxiety soon diminished. The tell part of Don't Ask, Don't Tell came to mean anyone, anywhere, anytime, regardless of circumstances. Later in 1994, Bridget Wilson took the case of a woman sailor who'd left her military husband for another woman. The husband had shown up at the other woman's house with a gun, screaming he'd kill them both. The woman sailor called the police and pressed charges. Before the case came to trial, the man informed her superiors she was living as a lesbian. Two NIS men were sent to sit at the back of the gallery during the man's trial and take notes, not about his waving a gun at the two women, and threatening a double murder, but about his ex-wife admitting on the stand she was in a relationship with another woman. She told, that was enough to get her thrown out of the Navy. No recourse. Most gays and lesbians in the military were able to serve without incident under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. They didn't get caught. They weren't booted out. They didn't endure disgrace. But they suffered anyway. The policy of swords over domicles hanging always over their heads. They didn't have to tell to make the world come crashing down. 
They could be exposed in all sorts of ways that would be considered tantamount to telling. Lieutenant, Com Lieutenant Commander Judy J.P. Pearson Purcell had been a boat engineer and an, and an engineer instructor at the in the Coast Guard. She earned ribbons in all the colors of the rainbow and a chest full of silver and brass medals, commendations, achievements, meritorious service. She took her work so seriously that her fellow officers used to say that she was married to the Coast Guard. She wasn't, but she couldn't tell them to whom she was really married, another woman, also in the Coast Guard. Though Purcell was pretty sure to make commander, she retired before that happened because she feared they'd be found out, even though they did everything they could to prevent it. To her and her younger partner, Coast Guard Chief at, of Waterways Management, Diana Wickman, the things they had to do to not tell kept chipping away every single day at the essence of who they were. They felt the grief of it strongly when Wickman was in a car wreck, a head-on collision at 40 miles an hour. Sitting in the middle of the street in a banged-up automobile with a bandaged up and bloodied head, she fought to keep consciousness. She, met, she managed to call Purcell on her cell phone. Then, good soldier that she always was, she realized that she had to report the incident to her commanding officer. She called him next. In her mixed-up state, Wickman had forgotten to do what she'd always done, take care that nobody could possibly see that she and Purcell were a couple. In the past, she'd managed not to tell by keeping Purcell away from unit parties, being careful about whom they invited to their home, making sure that in the restaurant she never said anything like, hey honey, what are you getting? because you never know who was at the next table. But now Wickman saw her partner approaching from one direction and her commanding officer approaching from the other. She panicked and said, don't hug me, don't show too much worry. She tried to mentally telegraph parcel, even a blood, as blood dripped down from her head and she felt she might faint. Parcel, still running towards the car, slowed down because she got the telegraph. She couldn't confront Wickman or show too much Concern. I'm her roommate, she told Wickman, its commanding officer, trying to sound uninvolved, like someone who shared the rent and nothing more. You okay? She asked Wickman without touching her, thinking that's the rule of the game. Step back. Don't give him any idea that I love her. Yeah, you can go now. Thanks for coming, Wickman said, though she was suffering neck pain and bleeding badly and wanted Purcell to hold her and make her, take her to the hospital. But she was terrified that if the commanding officer saw them together, too, he'd guess. She had to send her partner away, get her out of the scene immediately, and she did. Diana Wickman remained in the Coast Guard until 2009, but she too retired early, before she was eligible for her full pension, because like J.P. Parcel, she feared constantly that she'd be kicked out of the military that she loved. Her mil My military family, she called her unit, and she'd lose her pension she'd already earned and all the benefits she worked for during her 22-year career. All it would take was one misstep. Dude, this is somehow worse than the gay history book I was reading. Okay, maybe not worse. Pretty bad. In fact, it didn't even take a misstep to lose everything. Under don't ask, don't tell. Caution and discretion guaranteed nothing. You didn't have to tell by word of word or deed to get in trouble. Someone else might tell on you. And that could end your career, regardless of how many medals or years of exemplary service you'd racked up. Women's service members seem to have been particularly vulnerable. They made up only 14% of the army, but they accounted for 46% of the discharges under Fort Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. They made up only 20% of the Air Force, but they accounted for 49% of its Don't Ask, Don't Tell air, um, discharges. Margaret Witt joined the Air Force at the rank of second lieutenant in, in 1987 after graduating from college with a nursing degree. She was deployed to Iraq as a flight nurse on cargo aircraft that had been converted into flying intensive care units in which to medevac the wounded. She became a legend in her unit for having saved the life of an airman who'd been given up for dead. Wit's comrades and subordinates loved her because she was gregarious and funny and, as they later testify, the calmness of her look under pressure and her knack for making them all feel important to the team were inspiring. In 1999, she was promoted to major. In 2004, her 18 years of service, 18th year of service, 
She was in the Air Force Reserve, and because she had been highly decorated and had always received outstanding performance reviews, she expected that a promotion to lieutenant colonel was imminent. She was stationed at Joint Base Lewis McCord outside of Tacoma, Washington, working as the chief of standards and evaluations when one day her commanding officer, Colonel Mary Walker, showed up at her office and said, come with me. There was some kind of investigation going on about something on base, the colonel told, the colonel told Witt. They just want to ask you a few questions. Witt assumed the questions had to do with standard evaluation, standards or evaluation. She followed her commander down the hall into a conference room. There she was introduced to a lone man, Major Adam Torum, who was sitting at the table. Nice to meet you, Witt said. What is your relationship with Tiffany Jensen? Major Torum answered. Margaret Witt had done everything during her time in the Air Force, never to be asked such a question. She lived discreetly with, with Tiffany Jensen, 250 miles away from the base where she did her reserve duties. They'd been together for six years. But when Jensen said she wanted to have a baby and wanted Witt to legally adopt the child, Witt knew she couldn't do it. She couldn't put her name on adoption papers because that would be telling. She and Jensen broke up over it. A year or so later, Witt began a relationship with a woman who'd been married, Lori Johnson McChesney. Lori's estranged husband, Pat McChesney, Stalked the two women, stole Margaret Witt's address book, and called everyone in it, her priest, her favorite high school teacher, her parents, to complain that she'd stolen his wife. The one person he called who said she'd testify against a witness was Tiffany Jensen. Pat, Pat McChesney sent Witt's superiors an email accusing her of being a lesbian, messing with his wife. He followed it up by sending them a copy of the Ten Commandments. Witt's superiors discounted the complaint as coming from a, a kook. When Tiffany Jensen called to inform them of Witt's lesbianism, they listened. That November, Colonel Walker showed up again at Witt's office door, this time to say, Maggie, this is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. I have to ask you to pass your things, pack your things and leave the base. You can no longer serve. Witt was formally discharged yet, wasn't formally discharged yet but she was suspended with no pay. It wasn't until March 2006 she was finally informed that the Air Force was starting discharge proceedings on her. Witt had heard of Colonel Margaret Kammermeyer. Probably most gay and lesbian service members have heard of the Colonel's victory over the Department of Defense. Kammermeyer, too, lived in Washington State. She had been Witt's hero, though Witt had never imagined she'd be in a, circum in a situation like Kammermeyer's. Now she called the Colonel and told her her story how she'd had a long and perfect service record, how she'd follow the rules and kept her personal life hidden, how she wanted to stop the military from doing to other gays and lesbians what they were doing to her. This is what you're going to do, Kammermeyer told her. Drive to my house, Major. Your mission has changed. You're going to make a difference. She put Wit in touch with an army of lawyers looking for a case just like hers that would help give Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Don't tell. It's coup de grace. In April, they filed suit in a federal district court saying that Don't Ask, Don't Tell violated Margaret Witt's constitutional rights to equal protection and due process. But in judicial deference to the military, the district court judge, Ronald Layton, a George W. Bush appointee, declared that the prohibition against homosexual conduct is a long-standing element of military law that continues to be necessary in the unique circumstances of military service. He dismissed Margaret Witt's suit. She appealed. In 2003, after hearing Lawrence v. Texas, the U.S. Supreme Court had reversed itself on the subject of sodomy. The justices threw out the 1986 Bauer v. Hardwick decision that said states had the right to make sodomy illegal, and they declared that sodomy laws violated a citizen's constitutional right to privacy. Now, in 2008, a three-judge appeals court that heard Witt's case ruled that under Lawrence, don't ask, don't tell, intruded on the personal and private lives of homosexuals. And if the military wanted to intrude, it, at the least it had to show there was a reason for it. What's the nexus? The appeals court judges asked, just as judges had been asking since the mid-1960s. The Washington State Appeals Court tossed Margaret Witt's case back to Judge Layton. Conduct, conduct a trial, the appeals court judge ordered, and let the Air Force try to prove that Major Witt was bad for military morale. 
The trial in Judge Layton's Tacoma courtroom lasted six days and was packed every day with Major Witt's military friends, including Marguerite Karemeyer. When Major Witt left, it was like losing a member of our family, one airman testified. It was a dishonorable act on the part of the Air Force to discharge her. I would not, I should not be about what you are, but who you are, a master sergeant said. It was her being fired that actually hurt morale in our unit, another airman said. We were at war when she was discharged. It was like losing an able flight nurse. It was the loss of an able flight nurse, the lieutenant colonel complained. Several said they'd always suspected that Margaret Wood might be a lesbian, but it never made a difference. And some added they'd known or suspected other members in the unit had also been lesbian or gay, and it had no defect whatsoever on unit morale or cohesion. The best the government lawyers could offer to counter the walk-on-water testimony from Margaret Witt was that she might be deployed someplace where primitive facilities and forced in intimacy would be the norm. And what then, they wanted to know. There was no question about which side was more persuasive. What, like she'd have to share a tent with somebody? Like they think that she can't like not assault. I don't understand what the fuck they're trying to say. Judge Layton did an about face in his 200, 2006 judgment. Good flight nurses are hard to find, he said. The evidence produced at the trial not only showed that she, her discharge didn't advantage the military's purpose, her leaving resulted in a diminu diminution of her unit's ability to carry out its mission. The judge went even further in repudiating Don't Ask, Don't Tell by offering an eloquent defense of all the gays and lesbians that the witness had said were in the unit. These people train together, fly together, care for patients together, deploy together, Leighton emotionally declared. There is nothing in the record before this court suggesting that sexual orientation has negatively impacted their performance, dedication, or enthusiasm. There is no evidence that wounded troops care about the sexual orientation of the flight nurse or medical technician tending to their wounds. President George W. Bush's appointee ordered that Major Witt be restored to her position as a flight nurse as soon as possible. It's ironic that Don't Ask, Don't Tell had its genesis in Bill Clinton's good intentions to get rid of military witch hunts and to include gays and lesbians in his vision of a just America. Under the policy that he accepted as a compromise to his initial brave impulse, well over 14,000 service members were discharged, most of them not because they told, because the military found out in one way or another. Taxpayers spent more than $1.3 billion for investigations to help the military find out and to justify the discharges. So, okay, think about it from the Republican perspective. Isn't that like a huge fucking waste of money? $1.3 billion. That's an insane amount of money, bro. That's like... And he literally said one of the reasons that we want to do this is so we don't waste taxpayer money anymore. What a load of shit. Despite the gains the gay and lesbian movement had made in shifting public opinion, even into the 21st century, military leaders, hardly the most progressive thinkers, continued to regard gays and lesbians as disruptive to their mission, just as their predecessors had in the 1950s when, without a shred of evidence, they accused homosexuals of being a threat to the nation's security. The discharges peaked in 2001, when 1,273 service members were booted out that year through the policy. The shibboleth was unit cohesion threat instead of security threat. But Don't Ask, Don't Tell was applied as viciously as the old regulations had been. However, not even the military could hold out indefinitely against court decisions and the social change affected by years of gay and lesbian activism. The Gallup News Service announced in spring of 2007 that its latest poll had found that tolerance for gays' rights was at a high watermark. That same year, 28 retired generals and admirals signed a letter urging the Congress to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. There was over a million gay and lesbian veterans and generals and admirals pointed out six, 65,000 gays and lesbians were pr presently serving honorably, and the current 
generation of young people entering the military were much more accepting of gays and lesbians than earlier generations had been. That next year, 104 retired admirals and generals came forward to say the same thing. Perhaps not so coincidentally, the military had been stretched thin by continued deployment in the Middle East, and as General John Salakashvili, who'd been chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, pointed out, we must welcome the service of any American who is willing and able to do the job. The year after that, in 2009, after a Washington Post poll announced that 75% of those polled agreed that gay people should be allowed to serve openly, Colin Powell, who'd heard headed the Joint Chiefs of Staff when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was adopted, declared to the media, 16 years have now gone by, and I think a lot has changed with respect to the attitudes within our country. It was time to reconsider the old policy, General Powell said. Chapter 27. Get, Don't Ask, Don't Tell done. A justice at tortoise speed. I'm not going to like read the chapter. We're going to read like the first bit of it. Because I think what it's basically getting at is that even though they were like, end, don't ask, don't tell. It took like a long time for it to actually happen. Because I remember like it happened at a time when I was like watching the news. So it wasn't 2009. I don't think. Right? Like what? What year? Yeah, we're in 2009 now on this page. Okay. As a senator from Illinois, Barack Obama abhorred Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Gays and lesbians had a right to serve their country, he absolutely declared in 2007. Just as black people had to be integrated into the military, gays and lesbians should be too, he said. He won gay and lesbian hearts, this young, eloquent, forthright champion of justice who belonged to a persecuted minority and was in tune with other persecuted minorities. As a candidate for the 2008 Democratic presidential nomination, Obama was more slippery. His major rival, Hillary Clinton, had opened herself from the start to the LGBT media, giving interviews to LGBT newspapers appearing on the LGBT television channel logo, telling the community in person how strong a champion for their rights she'd be. The Obama campaign placed ads in LGBT papers, but Obama wouldn't talk to anyone from the gay media. Finally, two weeks before the April 27th Pennsylvania primary, he did a careful interview for the advocate the carefully vetted interviewer, female, young, no radical baggage. Okay, whatever. Um, okay, yeah. I thought it was just going to say, like, don't ask, don't tell, didn't actually get repealed, even though it should be. Um, but it seems much more complicated than that. Because it's he has the same problems that Clinton had, which was that like, if he makes this like a titular issue of his of the beginning of his presidency or even of his campaign, then he'll be like fucked from like the get go of his like having power, you know. So okay, anyway, so that's chapter twenty seven. I think there's thirty two chapters. Thirty three chapters. So we have seven chapters left. All right, guys. Oh, 11. Fuck, I'm like some kind of a fucking genius. Didn't I say at 10 this would be done at 11? Do you have anything to say before I end the stream, people? If you're the same ones who've been here for like a thousand years. No? No? Yeah. Well. Decrepitude's Grasp. What a fucking name, bro. Okay, well, I assume that you guys are like asleep or something because you're not saying anything to me. Um, I'm really tired now. I'm gonna go. 
and like chill out and stuff and go to bed soon. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you got something out of it. Um, I might leave this video up for like a day and see what people say about it. I don't know though. I feel um, strange about like starting in chapter 26 of a book. Like it's fucking weird, right? And then I definitely don't feel like rereading this book. Like it's it's interesting and I'm glad I read it, but it, I like I have a lot of other books I need to read. I don't feel like, you know, so. That's what I thought. I'm falling asleep, bro. That's why I kept like scratching my head and like readjusting my chair and like drinking so much. Like I'm like falling asleep, so. But I wanted to finish like because I, you know, I was like, I got started. I, I, I need to finish it if I start the chapter, you know. Okay. I hope you guys have a nice night. <clears throat> Maybe I'll leave these up in like title them as like casual non sequitur readings or just like put the title of the chapter and not the book or something i don't fucking know we'll see anyway thanks for sticking around the whole time Emma. that was awesome um night guys bye